Shadow of the Colossus is one of those games that you might have found yourself buying more than once. One copy to keep in good condition and a spare to lend out to friends when they inevitably ask to borrow it. Times are much different now, with less physical copies of games being used and shared, but this game hasn't changed at all. Shadow of the Colossus is a near-perfect game, front to back. It's worth every bit of hype and praise it's received, and it hasn't aged a bit. My name is Leon, this is my spoiler-free love letter for the award-winning PS2 masterpiece that is Shadow of the Colossus. Team Ico released the widely anticipated spiritual successor to the art piece that was Ico for the PlayStation 2 way back in the console game Golden Age in 2005. According to Wikipedia, and I did not know this before researching, Shadow was originally conceived as a multiplayer online game called Nico, but over its long production cycle, it evolved into a single player action adventure game, and I think I can speak for everyone when I say we're pretty happy with how things turned out. Consistently ranked as one of the greatest video games ever made, the players immediately made aware of Team Ico's craft as soon as they're dropped and subsequently immersed in Shadow's world. An HD remake was released for the PlayStation in 2018 that features high-def graphics, and it even sold better than the original release, which I assume is due to the fact that so many players remembered like how good the game was in the first place, hyped it up, bought it for their second or third time, and then influenced new players to buy it as well. In the first five minutes of Shadow, rather the first five seconds of like the pre-game intro, as soon as this stringy choral track drops, the players swept into another world. The desaturated earthly palette, bright lights, and gloomy weather set the tone for the game's story. Old, isolated, dark. <laughs> the clouds disperse and the light increases as our horseback hero passes through a massive mossy structure, laying bare a long and weathered bridge we all know he has to cross. Come to find that there's another person on this horse, a pale feminine character shrouded in a patterned cloak. As the protagonists wander, the horse aggro and ghostly woman approach the center of an idol-filled room. The horse bucks and wander descends, carrying Mono up to an altar-like construction and placing her down. The cloak is torn off and her body is exposed to the player for the first time. A couple shadow-like creatures slink out of the ground, scaring me into thinking certainly that this is Ico 2.0, but Wander uses his magic sword's reflective light to banish the creatures and my assumptions as soon as they appear. It seems that this sword has gotten the spirit's attention. They tell Wanderer that he's not supposed to be here, but he's here to bring Mono back from the dead, and he is willing to do anything to achieve this goal. He makes a deal with Dormeen, who tell him that they'll consider his offer if he goes on to complete some tasks for them, in standard video game fashion. Dormeen explained that a series of idols must be destroyed, and in order to do so, Wander must defeat the incarnations of these idols sprawled across the land. Wander wields an ancient sword that's used throughout the game to direct the player towards the next colossus they have to slay in order to advance the story. In addition to this, Wander sports a bow and arrow as well, which is incredibly useful not only in the battles, but also in obtaining the fruits and lizard tails needed to increase the player's maximum health and grip strength. Wander is accompanied by his faithful friend and loyal companion steed, Agro, who is an integral part of the game all the way through. Imagine traversing this giant map on foot. I don't think so. There's also even a couple colossi that require you to ride aggro the whole time, including the loyal to a fault horse as part of the puzzle. This game is so carefully designed, it feels like every aspect is meaningful. It's a true minimalist's dream. All Wander knows is pet aggro, eat lizard tail, fall 200 feet, and lie on the ground, surrounded by shadow people. The first Colossus you encounter shows you the ropes of how to take down these massive beings. Shine your sword on them to reveal their weak spots, distract them in a way that leads you to those weak spots, 
attacked and continuously stabbed the shadowy life out of them. If a specific Colossus is giving you trouble and you take long enough, the ghostly chorus of Dormeen will gently guide you through the few riddles you need to help tear them down. This is Shadow of the Colossus' goal, for you to take out giant baddie after giant baddie, increasing your strength and skill as you navigate the massive world map in the hopes of reviving the cursed sleeping princess. All in all, there are 16 different colossi to conquer, each with their own special little puzzles and maps that add to their overall vibe. Fans have come up with names for these colossi based on Latin words that kinda, sorta match the vibes the colossi give off. Kumito Ueda, one of the directors of the game, said that he designed the colossi battles to be sorta like inverted Zelda dungeons, with an underlying feel of cruelty as a means of expression. Recognizing how different it feels to take on a huge monster up close and personal with like a teeny tiny sword as opposed to long range magic whatever, forcing this kind of like intimacy on the player. You know, like you're really killing this thing, aren't you? And trust me, it does feel painful and intimate and cruel indeed to tackle some of these colossi. Some stand out more than others as kind of like mean. Like, actually cruel. Like, why am I doing this again? Oh, yeah, that's right. Princess. Gotta, gotta save the princess. So, without spoiling the game too much, I'm gonna start going into a little more of the overall vibes. Shadow of the Colossus is a lonely game. Your only living, breathing companion is the horse, who, of course, can't speak but quickly becomes a creature of great importance. At least when I play, I find myself frequently trying to just pet Agro and check in on her. Whenever, you know, she gets hurt, I feel genuinely, like, responsible for that hurt. I blame myself, you know, for not leaving her behind far enough or for not distracting the Colossus well enough to keep her safe. The game mimics the kind of feelings one might get from spending all of their time alone, hyper-focused on projects that have unknown results. Little by little, the player gets hints about what's going on, but for the most part, the story kind of keeps to itself, allowing the player to fill in some of the blanks. I think that games that utilize this technique of only telling you so much of the story can be very effective in forming long-lasting memories of and relationships with a game, where you get to sort of write the story kind of alongside the story writer, so giving you a little more stake in its concept. Normally, I prefer games with a lot of dialogue, games that immerse me in the feeling of being surrounded by lively characters and rapidly changing scenes, but Shadow of the Colossus is nothing like that. Whenever I feel like testing the limits of my social isolation, I turn to Shadow of the Colossus to remind me what it feels like to truly be alone. The world map has little variation, but it's just enough to keep things fresh. One Colossus may bring you through the desert, one may bring you to a waterfall, a coliseum, but every part of the world is united by the appearance of these mossy stone remains of buildings or civilization. Who lived here and when, you might ask? What was all of this for? Why are the colossi also constructed of this material, and why aren't mortals allowed here? It's true that games like Shadow of the Colossus and Ico might leave the player with more questions than answers at the end, but that's just part of the fun in going through the game and sharing it with others. Your response to this game will most likely be different from mine, with different questions, answers, and experiences. Wise people have said before that good art asks more questions than it answers, and Shadow of the Colossus is a very good example of this concept. Another thing that Shadow does really well is the overall difficulty of the game. The difficulty is scaled gently with every battle, allowing the player enough time to familiarize themselves with the controls. Admittedly, I don't play platformers at all, and I don't have like years of experience in the genre, as evidenced by um, th this. However, after a little bit of practice, the controls are easily mastered, even by a turn-based degenerate like me. Of course, there's still a difference between simply defeating these colossi and slaying them with a style. Um, if you're interested in finding out what slaying them with style looks like, I um, strongly suggest watching a Shadow 
uh, speed run. <laughs> um, I personally suggest watching like the world record currently, Neurotaku speed run. It's available on Twitch, and I will put a link in the description. And he's pretty like humble, but um, it's just it's it's really a treat to watch someone who knows exactly what they're doing like go through the game, like any speed run. But anyway. I find that, naturally, there's some colossi that I really struggle with, and there's also some that I am just naturally better at. I think that this is like a commonly held experience, but uh, let me know what your hardest- who, who's your white whale? Let me know in the comments. <laughs> That's not to say, again, that these colossi are necessarily easy. Sometimes it takes a couple tries, a little active learning, and a little routing to get your sword in all the right spots. Part of the fun of Shadow is getting knocked down, and then picking yourself up right away, determined and ready to try again. I'm not saying I never rage quit. I do. <laughs> but I know that when I do, it's usually because I have some other shit going on. In the right headspace, I can gleefully attempt conquering these colossi multiple times, eager to move on to the next one. And speaking of moving on, I would like to spend a brief moment talking about the soundtrack. Some games have soundtracks that are incredible, standalone pieces that may or may not work with other games. Like the soundtrack for Final Fantasy VIII potentially being interchangeable with the soundtrack for like Persona 5 or something. Uh, I don't know. Please laugh. However, the soundtrack for Shadow of the Colossus is just perfect for Shadow. I don't think that it would translate well to any other game. If you disagree, I don't know. That's fine. But... I don't exactly know how to talk about music, but I can say that this soundtrack invokes a wide range of emotions for me. From feeling curiosity and wonderment at a new area by way of the little flutey numbers like this, Or from feeling like I'm doing something wrong when I hear these long and droning string numbers. Or even the passionate feelings of honor and responsibility that I have when I have a leg up in a battle with the Colossus, like in this song. There's a lot to be said about this soundtrack, but you'd probably do best going off to experience this one yourself. And I think now is a good time to address the obvious. Shadow of the Colossus is an incredible piece of visual art as well. Let's take a moment now to appreciate it from a visual perspective, now that we've gone through all of its other elements. Everything in this game is much, much bigger than Wander, bigger than you. The scale of player versus the world is just gigantic. <laughs> you really are walking around in the shadows of these colossi. Well, many of them. Anyway, there's a couple of small ones. But there's always so much to look at on the screen as you're traveling from location to location, these natural landscapes surrounding you with their lush and light. As you ride around the world on aggro, you might get a sense of like, this is all much bigger than me. And I mean figuratively now, like the story is bigger than me, bigger than my quest to reawaken the woman on the altar. Like I can't fight against these forces of nature working with and against me in a sense. I heard somewhere once that it's important to go outside because your eyes relax when you're looking at a horizon or something. So basically your eyes are two little pieces of brain and apparently that part of the brain likes to look at a lot of different things and when you're looking at a horizon or using panoramic vision and you're looking at a bunch of different things not focusing on one thing for too long, it lowers your stress. So you can uh, check out Andrew Huberman's work on this for more info. I'll put some links in the description. Apparently, you only need about like 10 minutes a day to positively impact your stress levels of like looking uh, at a horizon or, or looking outside or whatever. So yeah, that's, uh, that's really good. But the reality is many of us don't have the chance to go outside 
whether it's due to health, financial, location, or like lockdown issues. And I'm not about to say that like traversing the maps of open world games is a one-to-one -one substitute for going outside. Like it's certainly not the same as taking in real sunlight, breathing in real air, or touching real grass. But I am about to say that maybe, just maybe, it can help a little. There's no denying the physiological response that my body has when I ride around this map, looking up high at these cliffs, or exploring this absurdly beautiful little lake. I'm almost positive that I will never, ever in real life have the experience of riding a majestic horse who trusts me through a sprawling, seemingly endless, windy desert in the warm sunlight. I'm just not going to be able to do that. <laughs> but Shadow of the Colossus, you could argue that it's a grass-touching simulator in this way. I'm enjoying nature, I'm respecting animals, eating fruits, and talking to gods, and my brain is genuinely responding to those acts as if I'm actually doing them. Shadow isn't, of course, the only game that does this, but it is the game we're talking about right now. I mean, really. Just, like, look at this place. It is absolutely stunning. This is the closest I will ever get to enjoying a scene like this. I'll likely never get to search around this sunlit grotto, running between ancient ruins and hopping over streams to explore an abandoned structure. I most likely just won't. All in all, I want to get to the point of this video. I think Shadow of the Colossus is worth all the hype it's gotten since its release, and I think you should give it a try. It stands in stark contrast to many big box games released today, where you've got menus on menus on menus of items and information and tasks. Now, please don't get me wrong, um, I love these games too. Like, I love the micromanagement aspects of lots of games. I love spreadsheet games. It's like a core part of my gaming personality. But Shadow strays away from multitasking as a whole. You can only take one Colossus at a time, and only in the prescribed order. The game world's just a bunch of wide open spaces, beautiful, sprawling landscapes that are awe inspiring, relaxing, and serene. The soundtrack's capable of taking me through seasons of emotions curiosity, fear, triumph, retrospection. The story's only half told, leaving the player to decipher its code for themselves, letting you decide what's wrong and what's right. I love this game, and I think you might love it too. At the time of recording, Shadow of the Colossus is available through the PlayStation Store for $20, through the PS Now subscription service, and you can even find copies for the PS2 still for around $20 to $30 as well. Luckily, they printed enough copies to avoid scarcity, lol. What I mean by this is because Shadow of the Colossus was also reprinted as a Game of the Year edition, there were actually two times as many copies, physical copies of the game in circulation. So there's like overall at the at the end of the day, we get two times as many chances to play it on the original system it was released on. Um, honestly, like I'm a little bit of a boomer when it comes to physical media. So this concept is super exciting to me, even though the game of the year edition is valued as, at slightly less. It's just better overall to have more copies of it so that more people can see what it was like in the first place. Anyway, it's $20 well spent for about 10 hours of gameplay for an average player's first run, and about 2-3 to three hours if you choose to speedrun it. However, that's not to say that you won't pick this game up again, like every few years, to re-experience its magic. Most players I know keep a space reserved in their hearts always open for wander and aggro, with fond memories of their first time playing, or their favorite colossus kept near and dear. For what it's worth, my favorite is the eel, number seven, also called Hydrus. Uh, being underwater is absolutely terrifying for me, IRL. So this battle really, like, really freaks me out, you know? I have like a physical, visceral response to this fight. I, ima I, can, like, I can't help but imagine myself in Wander's shoes, soaking wet, cold, shocked, literally, struggling to hold my breath and desperately grasping the ancient fur of this gigantic electric eel as it slithers just below the lake's surface. It's just, it's such a great game. 
So yeah, TLDW Shadow of the Colossus is a great game. It costs about $20 to play for the rest of your life, and you will play it for the rest of your life. Everyone I know who's played through this game has loved it. The world, the soundtrack, the design, the plot, and the still fresh take on the action-adventure genre. Seriously, this game has aged like a fine wine, almost a vintage one now, and it's definitely worth your investment. I hope that in some way this video was educational and helpful for you in deciding as to whether or not you want to play Shadow of the Colossus 2, and please let me know if there's anything that you think I should have added or anything that I missed, or just tell me what your favorite aspect of Shadow of the Colossus is. I would love to be able to have a conversation with others about how immense this game and how big this game is and how uh, influential it is on games that are still made today. Like um, even Elden Ring is, is, is inspired by Shadow, so I think that's pretty important. You have to immerse yourself in the history. You gotta, you gotta do your video game homework, as it were. <laughs> Yeah, so thank you so much for watching. Um, I really hope you enjoyed this one. What do you think of my uh, Wander cosplay? <laughs> yeah, I never really was uh, too good at um, sewing, but it's such a sick pattern tunic. Um, Wander totally has like great style. <laughs> so let me know what you love about Shadow of Colossus in the comments, like I said before, and consider liking the video if you want to show your support for the channel. Uh, subscribe if you want an easier way of knowing when I post, and enjoy the rest of your daily scroll, stream, and everything in between. Uh, I'm gearing up to start making more videos about more games, kind of like review style, kind of like love letter style, like this one. Um, since, you know, I really only want to talk about games that I like. Um, but if there's a game that I review that you want to know more about, let me know in the comments and maybe I can give my own spin on certain aspects of the game, like an analysis or interpretation of it, or I can take a more educational route that maybe other creators haven't um, tackled yet. So again, thank you so much for watching and I really hope to see you again soon.